get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fog, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. All right, Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. You know, I have Dr. Courtney Baker, which I'll introduce you in a second, who's remarkable uh, as a business person, a human being. And, you know, Courtney, um, past guests, you know, I love hearing the challenge story. So a Julie Clark started Baby Einstein, grew it to $20 million with five employees, eventually sold to Disney. But to me, the most impressive part was she called herself the cancer assassin. She had cancer twice, over, you know, beat it, overcame it in, you know, there's enough hard stuff in just business and life. And then you have that and then you have to overcome it. So I love hearing those, those stories, you know, and so go check out that and more at inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And if you know me, if you don't, I think podcasting is the best thing since sliced bread. It's allowed me to form amazing relationships with people. And so we help businesses um, basically connect and run their their entire podcast, connect to their Dream 100, referral partners, put out their authority into the world and help themselves and their guests leave a legacy, okay? Check out my about page. I won't go into the full story, but I got into it and it was inspired by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor and his legacy lives on because of an interview, because the Holocaust Foundation didn't interview with him. You can watch the full hour long interview on, uh, on my about page and it's you know, it's things that I look at and have gratitude for, appreciation for. If I find myself complaining, Courtney, like I watch that, I'm like, I have nothing to complain about. Absolutely nothing to complain about. Okay. So um, check out that at rise25.com in general. If you have questions about podcasting, today's guest, um, I want to thank, big shout out to Andrea Houston, who introduced me to today's guest. Um, check out Artitude's design. They have clients like Microsoft, Starbucks, Salesforce, and they do virtual event production and design. And she also runs an amazing podcast, Lead Like a Woman podcast, where she features epic women, epic women leaders. And so I have Courtney Baker. If you, you know, Dr. Courtney Baker is one of those people, you know, after hearing your story, Courtney, I was like, just truly inspired. And now you pop into my head and I'm thinking, okay, if I'm complaining about something, if something's not going right, I'm like, wow, uh, what she has endured, um, if I was at that place, I don't know if I would be where you're at at all. You know, I maybe just have, you know, stayed on the path of not, you know, striving for more. I don't know. So she's the founder and CEO and chairman of board of, and the board of Kids Care Home Health. It's a multi-million dollar enterprise providing speech, physical, occupational, and nursing services to children with special needs from Texas to Colorado. The company has more than 650 employees and have provided healthcare to over 40,000 children with special needs. She also coaches female entrepreneurs on how to start and scale their own service-based businesses. And she's authored books, which you should check out, Unlimited, you know, Conquering the Myth of the Glass Ceiling, and the best-selling book, The 10 Do's and Don'ts for Business Leadership. She went from single teenage mom on Medicaid and food stamps working double shifts as a pregnant waitress to Texas Businesswoman of the Year after starting her successful company. And along the road, she also had some major challenges and had to endure a seven-hour brain surgery. Dr. Baker, Courtney, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I really wanted to start there because I think in this environment, every environment, I need to eat like humble pie. I need to be brought back to my roots of um, really where we came from, which is we all come from, or most of us like start from not a lot and have to build from scratch. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me about that. I don't know, maybe one of the times when you're single teenage mom, you're working double shifts mm -hmm. as a pregnant waitress. What was life like at that point for you? I, <laughs> that was 26 years ago, but I was scraping by um, just, I lived with my mom when I was pregnant and, um, had just decided really because of when I was 16, I lost my sister 
Hmm. and she had multiple sclerosis and I helped take care of her. I helped her walk and talk and feed her and I bathed her. And, um, when I was 18, I got pregnant and at 19, six months after I had, uh, graduated from high school was when my son was due. And because I'd had so much loss already in my life, I just knew that even though I was supposed to give him up for adoption, I just couldn't. And at that point, I said, you know what, if I have one shot at this, which I do, then I'd rather figure it out and keep him than have to endure that loss again. Was that even a decision that was that a hard decision or were you thinking I'm keeping this no matter, you know, keeping the baby no matter what? You know, some people have different mentalities around that. Maybe that wasn't even an option for you. Like you didn't even consider that at the time not keeping him yeah like giving away like you just mentioned giving away for adoption or you know yeah i was gonna have i was gonna have uh, give him up for adoption i was mm. gonna have him and give him to my seventh grade math teacher wow yeah so i already had a family and everything picked up for him and i just knew that i couldn't do it and i actually heard the old dolly barton song i will always love you and i was like it just broke me and i was like i can't do it I cannot do it. So you are working double shifts. You're mm -hmm. pregnant and working double shifts at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah. I was pregnant in my earlobes, like all over the place. It was huge, huge. <laughs> it was miserable. <laughs> I've never heard that saying. That's a good saying, pregnant in my earlobes. Um, and at that time, you were seeing your friends going off, right? Mm -hmm. My friends were going to college, and I was going – to the food stamps office. Um, it was very humbling. So you're living with your mom, you have your baby. What are you thinking at this point? Cause it seems like you, did you have always have great aspirations at that point to have your own business? What, what was your thought process at that point? I didn't know I was going to have my own business. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew that I wasn't able to wait tables the rest of my life. Cause Patience is a virtue that I just wasn't blessed with. And so I didn't know how I was going to go to school, but I was going to go to school. That was my biggest. Because when I was growing up, it was always, where are you going to go? Not, are you going to go to school? And um, so I, I met my first husband um, and we got married and I moved to Illinois where I knew nobody and um, after six months of being a stay-at-home mom, I was like, this is for the birds. I can't do this. Um, and so I enrolled in junior college and started school. So at what point do you decide I am going to go on and get my doctorate? Well, that was actually, I finished undergrad and went directly into my master's degree. I'm a speech pathologist by training. And um, right before uh, I started undergrad at the, the university, I got divorced from my first husband three years into um, marriage. And um, it's a long story, but it was, I loved being married. We just weren't good for each other. And he's no longer with us. Um, mm. Passed away when my Sorry son. Sorry to hear that. Then. Yeah, I'm still really close to his family, though. Um, but I started school, and then I finished college with my master's degree in communication disorders and sciences right af right before September 11th. And then I, um, I was 28, and I was pretty much tired of being an undervalued employee for that I had been in, in the workforce and decided – pretty much I was going to do it myself and realize that if I could have a business and my competitive advantage be just to treat people well, then hmm. success would follow. I'm sure your sister underlying had some motivation in this. What did you learn from your sister? Um, she was so incredible. I mean, she, she admired me 
to the point where she just wanted me to succeed. And she, she would always say, and this was back then when beaches was like the big movie. And she would always say, Courtney, hmm. you're the wind beneath my wings. And I'd say, Kim, you're mine. Hmm. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And you think that, is that a big driving force for you through this company? Kids, co kids care, your home health. Yeah, it, it is. Um, and I didn't even know speech pathology existed back then. Um, and, you know, she's always, she is a part of my DNA. Um, and my mm -hmm. daughter's named after her. My daughter's named Grace Kimberly. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just, she's, she is the reason I, um, I do what I do. Yeah. I can see why the company is so successful and amazing because you have this such a strong driving force mm -hmm. from early on. Um, what are some of the, uh, maybe talk about some of the, your favorite stories of people you've helped, um, actually kids with special needs. Oh my goodness. Um, and I haven't been in the field in a long time, but when I first started the company, it was just me with 10 patients yeah. and I, my favorite area to go to i'm in dallas and my favorite area to go to was the south dallas projects because there were kids that um that had a rotating door of people that were in and out of their lives but they knew miss courtney was going to be a constant hmm. and i would drive up and i had two little girls and i had adored them and their names were Erica and Jasmine. And as soon as I'd pull up, I hadn't even put the car in park and they're running outside Miss Courtney. Mm. And they knew no matter what Mondays and Wednesdays at four o'clock, Miss Courtney was going to be there. Mm. What kind of stuff did you do with them? We worked on things like remembering their address and phone number. And, and, um, they had a lot of, uh, learning disabilities mm. and just things, activities of daily living to make sure that they were safe mm -hmm. in, in an unfamiliar environment, memorizing mm. their phone number and, and important things, um, that a 10 and nine year old little girl should know. It's amazing. You know, we take a lot of things, on a daily basis for granted, at least I do, I have to remind myself, you know, of those things. And I imagine going into those environments, it just puts a spotlight on things that we typically take for granted. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what were some other, so you decided to grow this thing at some point, right? Because you could have stayed, okay, I have my amazing client base and I serve them. What was your mindset around a point where you're like, okay, I want to have more staff. I want to serve more people. It was more of the idea of if it's just me, I can only see 10, 20 kids. But if I hire and do it the right way, then my the success of the company would be exponential. And that was the more of the reach that we would have. And there's so many out there that don't do things the right way. And I thought, this is my chance to really make a difference in their lives and make an impact the way it, I feel like a business should be run. Yeah. What do you look for? Because again, you have this, you know, this inborn passion and mission because of your sister and what you do. How do you hire? How do you find talent? What are you looking for in someone to hire? And how do you hire the right people? We hire for core value alignment. Mm -hmm. And our core values are commitment, accountability, results, and ethics. And if we don't see alignment in all of those, um, we we hire, hire slow and fire fast. Mm -hmm. So a commitment, accountability, results, and ethics. Mm -hmm. In an interview process, you know, people are putting their best foot forward. How, mm -hmm. what kind of questions or things do you look for in, in the ethics piece? We give situation-based questions. So, um, you know, early on in my journey at Kids Care, we were at a point, it was two years into the journey, and um, I had just broken up with my partner at the time, um, we had very different ethical, uh, 
we weren't ethically aligned. And then I had found out that one of our um, highest performing therapists was committing fraud. Mm. And it was about $100,000 of fraud. Wow. And she knew it and I knew it. And I could have really taken that opportunity to sweep something under the rug and just hope it went away. But I knew that I had worked so hard for my license and that everybody who worked there at Kids Care was dependent on me to make decisions that would help them keep their job. And I knew no matter how hard it was, I was going to do the right thing. So it was a simple decision, but it wasn't easy. And we called the OIG and, and reported ourselves and they came in and did a audit. And, you know, I knew I could have lost the business, but it was more important to do the right thing and take care of the people mm. so we could sleep at night. That's pretty intense. Courtney, like uh, it's almost like someone turning themselves in. I mean, in this case, it wasn't, you know, you realize it's not you who's doing it, but you're still putting your business at risk. But we build for it. Yeah. Yeah. So it was us. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So what did they do when they came in? Were they you were they more lenient because you just reported it yourself or mm -hmm. oh absolutely. And we paid the money back and um we didn't even I mean we we were cleared and that was in two thousand five. And then right after that, Jeremy, I had a pulmonary embolism. Jeez. So yeah, I mentioned that, you know. And the front of the interview where, okay, that's not enough. Then now you have to endure eventually a seven hour brain surgery. Right. But that was preceded, different. right. Preceded it was a pulmonary embolism. So mm -hmm. what happened at the time? What were you feeling? When I had the PE, I, yeah. um, I just couldn't breathe. I had this, I felt like I had a knife in my side and uh, my dog saved my life because I called my husband. And I was like, I don't feel good. I can't breathe, but you got to come home and let this dog in because I can't get to him. And uh, he came and, and was like, I, I need to take you to the hospital. Mm. And what did they say? Like, what what was the cause or what happened? Um, I'd had a hernia repaired and it was just, I don't know if it came from a deep vein thrombosis. I don't mm. know where it originated, but... Um, yeah, I was put on the uh, drip in in the hospital for about a week. Wow. So then fast forward, what happened around the brain surgery? How did that come about? So that was in 2012. Yeah. And it was after gum grafting. And I had a stroke in two places and had a seven-hour brain surgery. Wow. Was that related to at all? No, it was not related to pulmonary embolism or anything like that. It wasn't related necessarily, but I do have a clotting disorder. Mm. So, yeah. Jeez. And so what do you remember waking up from the surgery afterwards? After the surgery, I remember mm. thinking, I can't ever get health insurance if I'm not an entrepreneur. Because back then, you know, we didn't have this pre-existing condition thing. Um, and I would have, I just was like, if I ever, I I, I have to stay where I do it. I, I'll never get health insurance. And I was 37 years old. Wow. I mean, there's always a scare when you're going to brain surgery. I can't even imagine what's your thought process going in. I you, mean, you may be thinking like, I hope I just wake up. Well, I was so out of it from the stroke. I mean, I went to my sink to go wash my hair and I couldn't remember. I turned the water on and I couldn't remember what to do after the water came on. Wow. I looked at the water and I looked at the shampoo and conditioner and I looked at the water and I couldn't put the pieces together. And I remember that. But then after that, I had a seizure and then they called the ambulance and then um, I went to the hospital and it was two days Jeez. later that I had the surgery, brain surgery. Does your husband have multiple ulcers from this whole thing? I mean, what? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I always tell him I get to go first. And he was like, well, it's not like you've tried. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, oh my God, I can't imagine. Um, so what happens with the business when you come back? Like, how do you continue to run everything and. 
and function. Because I mean, it's a lot of hard when you're 100 percent healthy, right? There's a lot of stuff to do, and now you come out of brain surgery. Well, it's very interesting the timing of it all. I believe it's God. But in 2012, I had transitioned out of the daily operations. And you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, so you know that in entrepreneurship, I believe that there are there's two different camps. There's either builders or sustainers. And I'm a builder through and through. I love the building process. And we were really sustaining at that time. Mm -hmm. And that just... I wasn't fulfilled. And so I had transitioned out of the daily operations so I could go back to school and get my doctorate degree a month before the stroke. Hmm. Talk about that for a second, transitioning out of the daily operations. Um, you know, I talked to Michael Gerber uh, of the EMeth, who talks a lot about the systems and things to transition, you know, going from entrepreneur operator to transitioning out. It's I, it's hard for people to do. It take, Sometimes people never do it. Mm -hmm. What were the things that you were able to put in place, advice for other entrepreneurs who want to actually transition out of the daily operations? You have to have a really strong number two. That's first and foremost. And then you have to start training them on the things, the processes and operating procedures that you do and delegate. Mm-hmm. What was the biggest thing, the hardest thing for you to delegate? There's always that thing that I'm going to hold on to. This. this is the last thing that's going to, I'm going to grip onto that people are going to take away from me. What was that thing that you felt like you did better than anyone else? And this was the last thing you delegated before you fully transitioned out. You know, my husband always says I'm a master delegator, which I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but the hardest thing I, I don't know, because I just, I was so ready to go back to school at that point and really fulfill a, a dream that for that 19 year old single teenage mom who felt like she'd never amount to anything, um, to do it for her. Yeah. So I mean, it could be something, maybe, maybe you, you don't grip on and, and feel like you need to do it, but maybe what was the hardest job or function that you had to replace for you that you just... The company depended on this. Was there a specific role or job that you did that was harder to replace than others? I think it was probably learning our process for quality assurance and making mm -hmm. sure that our standards were super high and that that was carried through. Um, and But it wasn't so much that process was in place. Um, but it was getting somebody else to understand that process and implement that on their own and being okay with that. Do you have certain software or tools that you find helpful to document processes or to have uh, SOPs or any like softwares that people should look at out there at, at looking to help systemize? Well, for us, we use a uh, point of care system. Mm -hmm. So we, it's called CanTime and mm -hmm. it's like all of our patient records are in that. So we are completely digital, the entire company. Mm. What was, I want to talk about your book, mm -hmm. Dr. Baker. So conquering the myth of the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you mean by that exactly? So if you tell a little girl, you're going to have this object that's going to stand in your way and you're not going to be able to see it, feel it, taste it, smell it, or move it. And it's going to hold you back on your career climb. Good luck. She has no power. She's a victim. But instead, what my research found was that there are four challenges that women go through mm -hmm. when advancing their career. So instead, if we look at our journey as a maze or a labyrinth and know that there's going to be challenges and that we're going to hit this wall and we're going to have to go back and turn around and, you know, backtrack and go vertical or go horizontal to, to go vertical, then instead the power is in our hands hmm. and we can get to the end and persevere and create success however we define it. So what about the four challenges? What are they? Yeah. Okay. They're family obligations. Women do nearly twice the amount of work, childcare and housework 
than men do. And Probably that, like 10 times. Well, <laughs> that was pre-pandemic. Yeah. So um, okay. who knows what it is right now? Yeah. Um, and then the second one is limited advancement opportunities. Mm -hmm. The third is gender-based discrimination. And there's three facets of gender-based discrimination. The first is stereotypes. Women are damned if we do, damned if we don't. Mm -hmm. The second is the good old boys club, whom I lovingly refer to as Bubba. And Bubba's still out there, but not all men are Bubba's. And the third, though, is what threw me for the most loops was how many women were responsible for holding other women back. Hmm. And so if what we do you don't mean ever by play that? on the same team, yeah. well, through cat cattiness and backbiting and stabbing each other in the back and, you know, sabotaging, we really treat each other like crabs in a barrel. Hmm. And until we get to the point where we're playing on the same team, we can't ever, ever gain gender equality. And so um, what about the, the, the other book, the 10 do's and don'ts for business leadership. Maybe just go over what's a big don't. Well, the that, fourth challenge though on the challenge, research yes. was how many women lacked confidence, hmm. even at the executive level. So if you want to go to the do's and don'ts, what's one of the do's or don'ts? Yeah, maybe uh a don't like what's something maybe that's counterintuitive with a do or a don't for business leadership that you've found. Don't I'm trying to remember what all they were. It's been a while since I wrote that one. I mean, if you say you're going to do something, then follow through with it and have accountability and don't think that there's no way that you're infallible, you know, own your mistakes mm-hmm eat that humble pie yeah um the i'm curious also how did you how do you know andrea houston through entrepreneurs organization okay. EO. how has that affected or helped your business EO. oh my gosh i'm i am in a forum that has such a a good group of other entrepreneurs and met so many incredible entrepreneurs all over the world that I would have never had the opportunity to meet if I hadn't been an EO. Mm -hmm. It's a really incredible organization. And um, Courtney, I want people to check out your podcast too. They can go to CourtneyBaker.com and then just so you know how you spell her name, we'll link it up at C-O-R-T-N-E-Y Baker.com. Um, talk about your podcast a little bit. The type of like who's been a favorite guest, what kind of people can, what can they expect from episodes there? Women in business is the podcast. And on, I released two episodes a week and one is an interview and the Thursday episodes are just business tips and advice and strategies for female entrepreneurs. And, um, oh my gosh, I'm almost at 200 episodes this summer. I'll be at 200 episodes. So I've been doing it for Amazing. a while, a couple, a couple years, and I've had some incredible guests and it's really not names anybody would know, but the stories yeah. are so rich and just. What's a must what listen to? Which one sticks out? I mean, I'm sure they're all good, but what sticks out to you is this is a must listen. You should start here. Here's the, the the guest you should listen to the guest you should listen to yeah oh my gosh well my favorite my favorite solo episode i would say is the one that's um my ode to women who are too much why i'm okay being a bitch and <laughs> i don't remember the episode number like 160 something um but that's the title of it and that's my, that's unforgettable i'm not yeah, going to forget that one yeah and my favorite, gosh, I've had so many. Um, my favorite recent one was probably, um, I did one today and she sticks out in my head, Mary Grothy. And mm -hmm. she is not even on my show yet, but hers was good. Um, Darnielle Jervie Harmon's was good. Hers is coming out soon. 
any stories stick out? Like you said, obviously the the women leaders are telling some amazing stories. Mm -hmm. Like like this sticks out. The Julie Clark story totally sticks out. For me. I mean, there's certain stories that just stick out to me when I think about the podcast. One of the women that I interviewed early on, um, her father was a serial killer. Wow. So that sticks out. Jeez. She is actually Melissa Jesperson Moore, and she is on Dr. Oz a lot. Oh, my gosh. So what did she tell you about, about that time? Just how she was scared to in the early stages of getting her story out there, how scared she was because she thought people would be judging, you know, judge her for her father's actions. At the time, did she know her dad was like a serial killer or was this like she found out after the fact? She found out because she needed to, to work on a family tree for a school project. Mm. And that's how she found out. That's insane. And she's written a book about it since then and been on Oprah and yeah. Um, so people should, ch first of all, I have one last question um, or kind of two, but in one, one uh, compilation, I want to just encourage people to go to your website, um, CourtneyBaker.com. Again, I said C-O-R-T-N-E-Y Baker.com. Check out your books, check out your podcast, everything you have going on. It's really um, inspirational. It comes from being in the trenches of doing this stuff day in, day out. My, you know, since Inspired Insider, I always ask Courtney, what's been a low moment that you had to push through? And then what's been a proud milestone for you that you remember? What's been um, maybe a low moment that you had to, that was challenging that you had to push through? I mean, you have, you have a, a numerous of them, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, yeah. you know, I mean, they are what have made me today who I am. And yeah. Um, I believe people definitely um, admire your successes, but connect in your struggles. Mm. And one of my biggest struggles was just a few years ago in 2017, we lost $3 million overnight because of changes in the government. I mean, I'm in healthcare. So I feel um, you. yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. I mean, you're a chiropractor. So um, we are constantly at the mercy of whoever's in office. And um, so no fault of our own, just changes that we had no control over. You say so nonchalantly. We lost $3 million overnight, just changes, you know, which is the, which is the truth. It's yeah. just one code. People can change one code, billing code, and then boom, stuff evaporates. $3 million. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you communicate with the team? Like, what do you do at that point? Well, I mean, there was restructuring and realigning mm -hmm. of different, um, different service codes and things like that. And the thing was, it wasn't like it just hit our company, it hit our entire industry. Mm -hmm. So everyone dealt with it at the same time differently. And there were some people who didn't do it well. And when I say well, I mean, ethically, Mm -hmm. And that was something I wasn't going to compromise on. And since then, I have found one of my, if you want to go to the high moments, I was talking to somebody the other day and, and she said, you know, I've always heard nothing but how ethical of a company kids care is. Hmm. And that I'm very proud of that. Yeah. And then what did it feel like to win business woman of the year? It was an out of body experience um, because I was actually nominated for it in three years, um, two years, and then I won. And the second year that I didn't get it, I lost to Kendra Scott, the billionaire jewelry designer. And so I was like, I don't even know why I'm going to lose to anyone. I I'll know. Lose to that person. So it was really like third time's a charm or three strikes you're out. So, but really it was so incredible because I had quit drinking um, completely. I'm completely sober four years tomorrow. And um, I was able to, thank you. I was really able to feel like I was a hundred percent me and there. And it was, it was a really proud moment. Thank you for sharing that. Everyone check out CourtneyBaker.com. I think your next guest, I don't know if you've had, have you had Kendra Scott on the podcast? I haven't. Next. 
you heard it here, Kendra, if you're listening, you should be going on the Women in Business podcast. Thank you for all of you for listening and watching. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Courtney. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out.